before I go into some of the Mool Mantar, let's talk about the actual name of this Bani. Why is it called the Mool Mantar? What exactly does that mean itself? There's three reasons that I can give you. The word Mool means the root. So like you have the root of a tree, the word Mool means root. So this is the root of all Mantar. This is the root Mantar. That's the name Mool. That's what it means. The reason it's the root is because, as some people have said, Gurbani begins with the Mool Mantar. So the very beginning of the Guru's teaching, Guru's Mat, Guru's ethos, begins with the Mool Mantar. This is the root of this journey. So the very beginning of Gurmat teaching starts here with the Mool Mantar. The very root of the Guru Granth Sahib begins with the Mool Mantar. It's the very start. Another reason it's called the Mool Mantar is because the words in the Mool Mantar itself are the definitive root definition of the universe. It's the root definition of God. It's the root definition of the universe. It's at the very core of what <coughs> the message that it's trying to convey to you, this is the root definition of it. And just as all of the tree can be understood from the root, beginning from the root, drawing its energy from the root, so all of Gurbani can also be understood drawing its energy from this root. The third reason why it's called the Mool Mantar is because this is the root definition of you. This is a definition of you. And as you'll go through this course, you'll see that there's a lot of things here that you might not have heard before. Some of the things that we aren't taught will be covered today. The Mool Mantar isn't a description of some God somewhere else. It isn't just a description of God. It's also the definition of you. It defines at the root of what a human being is. And I'm sure many people would not have read the Mool Mantar and seen it as something defining themselves. But it is the root definition of what a human being is. And it starts at the beginning of the Japji Sahib. So if you are to understand the Japji Sahib first, you have to understand the Mool Mantar. And if you need to understand the Mool Mantar, you have to begin with the very first occur with the very first word, which is Ik. So in order to understand Japji Sahib, you need to understand the Mool Mantar. In order to understand the Mool Mantar, you have to understand Ik. So what does Ik mean? Ik defines a oneness. A oneness that is in everything. A oneness that exists in everything. And a oneness that isn't exclusive to anyone. This oneness doesn't belong to anyone. Nobody owns it. It isn't specific to any gender. It isn't stronger in males and weaker in females. It isn't stronger in humans and weaker in plants and animals. It is in everyone absolutely equally. But when you look at your translations, it will read, Ikwankar, there is one God. Most of your translations will say, there is one God. And in reality, that phrase, there is one God, doesn't actually begin to describe what Ik is trying to say. The other thing is that Ik actually isn't a word. It's actually a number. And the use of a number is also very beautiful, and we'll go on to this. The number one in itself is complete. The number one in itself 
I think in mathematics, do we talk about prime numbers? Numbers which in themselves don't break up easily into, into other whole numbers. And the very first prime number is one. So the most complete number is one. And within that, there's a clue. And the clue is that if one is complete, if the number is complete, then the thing that I'm going to talk to you about is also complete. The oneness, ik, God, call it whatever you want, is a complete entity. It isn't lacking anything. And oneness is also opposite to two. It's oppo opposite to two. Some people mentioned duality. Where there is one, there can't be two. If I ask how many of you are here right now, how many of you are here? Well, there's just me. There's just me. In fact, even if I was to clone you, you'd say, I can see that that looks like me, but that isn't me. I am me in myself. I'm complete. Even the mirror reflection isn't me. It may look like me, it may sound like me, but it isn't me. I am complete in myself. In myself, all that there is, all that you need to know about me is contained here, in this oneness. <coughs> so the number one is absolutely complete. One of the key things that I want to do in this course is I want to make sure that it always relates back to you. It always goes back to something that you can understand, you can go home, you can practice. So already we're talking about quite conceptual concepts. It's oneness, it's complete, it's whole, it's in everything. But the question that all of you are really asking is, well, what's that got to do with me? What do I do with this? And in reality, in one way or another, everybody has said, the truth is I'm trying to merge with this thing called God. I'm trying to find out what this God is, what is it, and how do I merge with it? Why am I not merged with it now? And in that very statement, you've created a duality. In the very statement, I am trying to merge with God, you've created two. There's an I, and then there's a God. So if there's an I and there's a God, how many are there? So Guru Nanak Dev Ji is first starting by telling you actually your very initial step into this journey has to be the right step. I am trying to merge with God, there's an I and there's a God. So straight away, you've broken the golden rule which is everything is one. All that there exists is one. Take a minute to think about what that means. All that exists is the one. You aren't part of something else. You are that something else. And this is where we now start thinking, actually, what I've been learning all this time, maybe I've been on the wrong path. It's like the waves of an ocean. It's a very simple analogy. Your life is simply like the wave of an ocean that rises up out of the ocean. And for a brief second, it says, look at me and then it goes back into the ocean. That moment that the wave came up, can anybody say that that wave is not the ocean? Can anyone say that the wave is separate from the ocean? You can't. It's just a wave of the ocean. So, in the same way, you are a wave of the oneness. 
you are a part of the oneness. It's like various fingers all arguing which one belongs to the hand. Can you say which one belongs to the hand and which one doesn't? You can't. They all belong to the same hand. In fact, they make up the hand. So how can you think that you are separate from the oneness? You aren't separate from oneness. And what that means is that I am not a separate entity to you. You are not different to the person sitting next to you. And the duality that we've created is that I'm over here, I'm not over there. I'm this guy here, I'm not that guy over there. I'm sitting on this side of the room, somebody else is sitting on that side of the room. That's not me. Fingers of the same hand, not able to see the hand. And the truth is that we've never looked at somebody else across the room and seen ourselves in that person. This is duality. This is where our thinking has been molded. The truth is that I don't exist as a separate entity to you. And duality, and more importantly, individuality. See how those words sound very similar? Duality and individuality. Individuality is the biggest disease that you have right now. And it is the disease of separation. Individuality is nothing more than a disease. And the Guru is the cure. Mera Ved Guru Gobinda. The Guru is my doctor, is the medicine man. Mera Ved. What is the disease? I. Homme dira grogahe. I is the disease. Me. I exist. I am. I am something. That itself is the disease. So the path of Sikhi is about curing yourself of this disease that I exist. All that exists are various forms of the one. The one exists. I is just an illusion. Oneness is the opposite of the way we've been living. Ik is the opposite of the way we've been thinking all of our lives. There isn't a me and a God. The very statement, I am trying to merge with God, begins with I am. I am here, and God is there, and I don't get why we're not together. Because your very statement, your very mindset itself, starts with a duality. Guru Nanak Dev Ji starts by trying to break that duality straight away. By ik, he's saying, let's get first things first. There isn't a you, and there isn't a God that you're trying to get to. Understand Ik and you understand the rest of Guru Granth Sahib. Understand Ik and you understand the spiritual journey of every spiritual tradition. Every tradition is just trying to do the same thing, which is to break this duality that exists within you, that I am separate from you. So we create dualities even in this journey I am trying to get to God. God is all things good, and I am all things bad. In the Abrahamic traditions, they say Satan is all things bad. Christianity, Islam, Judaism. Satan is all things bad, God is all things good. You've created two. We'll cover that today. 
माधो हम ऐसे तू ऐसा हम पापी तुम पाप खंडन आई एम द सिन यू आर द डिस्ट्रॉयर ऑफ सिन विल गो थ्रू दैट टुडे एंड द क्वेश्चन इज ऑलवेज आस्क्ड इफ देयर इज अ गॉड व्हाई डू बैड थिंग्स हैपन इफ गॉड इज विद अस व्हाई डू वी डू बैड थिंग्स and it's based on a dualistic thinking surely the good god wouldn't do this to me me and god so your very questioning is based on a duality and if your question is wrong no matter what answer is given to you you're not hearing what you want to hear because your very question is wrong the question that you go on to this path with is well tell me then how do i become one with god your very question is wrong and guru nanak dev ji starts at the very beginning and says let's just correct that question first let's just get that thinking sorted out first before we go any further so it's really beautiful why maharaj begins with ik in fact maharaj is telling you the answer here so we've talked a lot about i am let's talk about this terminology that we use called god even the terminology itself has a lot of characteristics intrinsic within each word the english translation says there is one god gurbani doesn't use that kind of language because gurbani is very aware of the use of language every single akhar every word every letter is very specifically chosen so that you don't enter into false thinking what do you think about when you when somebody says the word god to you when someone says the word god you think of a a human like character most of you will think of an elderly male the feminist among you will think of a female and say no god is definitely female and this god character human like character is somewhere somewhere far i like to call that guy mr god that guy over there the more simplistic your understanding you will say the god is sitting up in heaven somewhere दरगाह च बैठा सच खंड च बैठा सो गॉड इज देर इज अ गॉड ही शी सिट समवेयर एंड बाय यूजिंग टर्मिनोलॉजी यू क्रिएट ड्यूअलिटी गुरु नानक देव जी चॉइस ऑफ टर्मिनोलॉजी इज आल्सो वेरी अप्रोप्रिएट नॉट अलाउंग यू टू एंटर इनटू ड्यूअलिटी सो इफ there isn't an i and there isn't a god and all of this is one you may ask the question well how can i be god it sounds nice me and god god and me are one it sounds nice but how can i be god god is all things good and i know that i'm not all things good i'm a sinner i'm a puppy I do bad things, I have bad thoughts. How can I be part of this which is all things good? So by this thinking that I am a sinner, what your ego is doing is it's creating a trick. It allows you to have an ego and it says i am a sinner and by allowing yourself the label that i am a sinner you're saying well at least i am i might be a sinner but i'm here at least because the alternative what guru nanak dev ji is saying is you are not you're not even here and that's too difficult for us to accept 
Firstly, physically, we can't understand how does that work. Secondly, we can't accept that we aren't here. Because in reality, you all quite like yourselves. We all quite like who we are. Even if we say, I'm a sinner, in reality we say, yeah, but I'm not that bad. Everyone else is worse than me. I'm not that bad, am I? And by saying I'm not that bad, you're saying, actually, I'm a good friend of mine. I'm all right. I'm okay. I am, I am, I am. Even saying I am a sinner, you're saying I am. I am not that bad. I am. It starts with I am. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is starting with something completely different. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji is actually introducing a mathematical formula here. And this is the formula by which we need to understand Ik and by which we need to understand Gurbani. Guru Nanak Dev Ji's formula is this. One plus one equals one. There's never room for two. And this is a perfect, complete formula in its own. You can't create two. There's just more of the same one. If I have one drop of water and I add another drop of water, have I created two things? Or have I just created more of the same? We're two drops of water looking at each other and saying, I'm not you, you're not me, we're not the same thing. Each drop of water may look slightly different, may have slightly more or less molecules in it, one might have a bit more purity in it, one might have a few more other things mixed into it. And the one that's a bit purer saying, I'm a bit better than you, I'm purer than you. And the one that's a bit worse is saying, I'm a sinner, I'm worse than you. But you're just the same thing. This is Guru Nanak Dev Ji's formula that he's introducing here. If you want to understand Sikhi, if you want to understand Mool Mantar, this is a complete formula that Guru Nanak Dev Ji is introducing to you. And every definition of Sikhi has to fit within this answer. Every line that you read in Gurbani has to go back to Ik. Every time you want to understand something in Guru Granth Sahib Ji, you first have to remember Ik. And you have to say, how does this fit with the definition of Ik? And as we go through today, we'll keep reiterating this point. How do we get to understand this even more? On your spiritual path, this is the answer to every spiritual question. And initially that won't make any sense. How do I get rid of my, my calm, krodh, love, mohankar? How do I get rid of my anger, lust, desire, greed, attachments? The answer is ik. But initially, it won't make any sense. I said, that's not the answer to my question. But it is the answer to your question. You just don't understand it yet. It's like somebody entering in school. We walk into school, we walk into the Gurdwara, we read a Hukam Nama, and we expect that we have to understand everything there and then. Because if I don't understand everything right here, right now, then this stuff ain't right. The Sikhi stuff doesn't work. And then people walk away from Sikhi saying, I've it doesn't make any sense. People step away from religion and they say religion is nonsense. People step away from God and say God doesn't exist. Did you ask the right questions? Were you in the right frame of mind to understand what God was? Can you understand what God is? Can the drop of water understand the entirety of the ocean? Whether he's in the ocean or not, can he understand the entirety of it all? So Guru Nanak Dev Ji is giving you the answer up front. When Guruji begins Bani with Ik, begins the Mool Mantra with Ik, he starts with the answer. Ik is the answer. So, another question you might ask, why don't I feel part of the oneness then? 
If I am the same as this oneness, why don't I feel it? What's going on? And this is the delusion of separation that we have within us. Why am I separate from God? The separation is something that's been ingrained in us. You've been taught that you're separate from God far longer than that you've been taught that you're part of God. And whether it's consciously or subconsciously, directly or indirectly, this is how we've all been brought up. You must do better than everybody else in your class. You must be the first in your class. When you go for a job interview, make sure you're the one that gets it. Make sure you get all the qualifications that you need, that you can go and get the best job that you need to get. If somebody buys a car, you go buy something a bit better. If someone's wearing the latest designs, you go and make sure that you're one step ahead. And these messages of individuality and separation are bombarding us all the time. Consumerism, advertising, fashion, all these kind of things are bombarding us. The things by themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with wearing nice clothes. There's nothing wrong with buying a good car. But it's the mindset that we have to address. There's no point you walking away and saying, right, I'm never going to wear fashionable clothes and I'm never going to drive a good car and I'm just going to wear broken sandals and I'm just going to wear the most simple kurta pajama and that's it, I'm going to be a sadhu banda. I'm going to go live a saintly life. Because what have you done? All you've done is change your clothes. The thing that you had to look for, you haven't looked for. All you've done is changed nice shoes for worse shoes. You've changed nice clothes for worse clothes. And then you create an ego. Look how, look how holy I am. Look at me. All of you people in your fashionable clothes, look at me. I'm a sadhu. You've replaced one ego with another ego. I am. I am a sadhu. Until you address this I am, you haven't started your journey of Sikhi yet. Until you address... Who am I? What am I? You can wear what you want, do what you want, read what you want, recite what you want. If you haven't addressed the fact that it's talking about me and not about Mr. God, you haven't actually started. And that is where it becomes quite a sour, bitter pill to swallow. Okay, have I just been wasting my time? And at this point, some people can walk away and say, I don't like this message. I'm all right with my Sangat. We all go to the Gurdwara together. We all run camps together. We all do seek things together. We're nice people. We're not hurting anyone. But all you're doing is you've replaced one Sangat with another. If you used to go out clubbing and you used to go out smoking and drinking, what you've done is replace that with a different group of friends that just do a different set of things. But you haven't addressed, who am I? If I am now a Gurmukh and I used to be a Manmukh, by saying I am a Gurmukh, first you're saying I am. And if you're saying that I am a Gurmukh, you're not a Gurmukh. Because you don't know yourself. You don't know what you are. So there's a reason why I don't feel part of this oneness. Because we've never really been trained that this is the journey to question who you are. What we've been told is Sikhi is about merging with God. So read lots of stuff about this God. And somewhere, somehow, something's going to happen. But Guru Nanak is doing something different. Guru Nanak is saying, well, let's first address who you think you are. Because when you understand who you are, then you may be able to understand what God is. If the drop of water understands what it is, there's a chance that it can understand what the ocean is. 
if the drop of water doesn't even know that it's made up of the same stuff as the ocean, how is it going to understand the ocean? If it doesn't even know that it itself is the same thing. So there's a reason why you don't feel this oneness. There's a reason why we walk around with our separation. It's conditioning for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long you've lived. It's conditioning. We've been conditioned to think a particular way. The Buddhists have a very simple analogy. One fish swims up to another fish and says, so where's this water that everyone keeps talking about? And this is like us. One Sikh goes to another Sikh, so where's this God that everyone keeps talking about? The fish doesn't understand he's in water. The Buddhists say, trying to understand this oneness is like trying to teach a fish what is water. He can't understand what is water. He's in water, he drinks water, he breathes water, he's made up of water. Every cell in his body is water. Everything that he sees is water, but he can't understand it. And then when you start using this terminology, this is the sort of terminology that Barney is using. Everywhere I see you, you are in everything, you are in everything. But we're like, where? Show me, why can't I see it? Because the very eyes with which you're looking need to be adjusted. You're walking around and you've got these big, thick, black goggles in front of you. Guru Nanak Dev Ji starts by taking those goggles off and saying, now look at the world. The very eyes that you were using to look at the world were incorrect. Because they looked at the world saying, I'm here, but I can't see where you are. I know I'm here. Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, well, what, let's just look at that first. Before you try and understand everything else, let's just look at what you think I am is. So there's a reason why you can ask this question, well, it makes sense that I'm part of one, but why don't I feel part of this one? Darshan is realization, awakening. The moment you realize, it is darshan. It is not that darshan comes to you. The darshan is, the realization is, it's always been here. I just didn't know where to look. It's like somebody asking you, the sun doesn't shine in my window. Why doesn't the sun shine through my window? And you're sitting in the room with all the curtains closed. And you're saying the sun doesn't shine. There is no sun. You have to open the curtains. And when you open the curtains, you can say, oh, the sun came to me. No, the sun was always there. The sun hasn't gone anywhere. It's always been there. But you're covering yourself. And what is the veil that we cover ourselves with? The veil that we cover ourselves with is our own identity. We create a wall around us. And this is who I am. This is what I am. Where does this thinking come from? In Western psychology, the basis of Western thinking stems from a statement made by someone called Rene Descartes. I think it's about 17, 1800s. Western understanding of the universe isn't really that old. Rene Descartes is a French philosopher. And he set out and said, I'm going to go find what the truth is. And he applied what he calls the method of doubt. And the method of doubt says, I'm going to doubt everything that exists and see if I can disprove it, then I know it exists. But if I can always doubt that it exists, then it, does, it isn't the truth. It isn't ultimate truth. So he goes out and he says, well, I don't know that all of you are sitting here right now. If I'm sitting in a room with lots of people, I don't know that you're really here. There's a chance that you're not actually here, that I'm dreaming. Or there's a chance that you're a hallucination. You know how sometimes you hear about this analogy that somebody's walking through a desert 
for hours and hours and hours or days and days. And in the distance, they think they can see like some beautiful lagoon with water and palm trees. And when they walk there, it's a mirage. It's not really there. So he says that you could be a mirage. The tree outside could be a mirage. Even if I go and hug the tree and I touch the tree, it could be a dream. Because sometimes in my dream, I felt like something is real, but it's not really real. It's not really there. So he applies this method of doubt to everything. I'm not sure you exist. I'm not sure this is true. I'm not sure that it's actually daytime. In some countries, it's daylight for six months of the year. So it's nighttime or daytime, you can't tell. So he says, I can't tell if it's daytime right now. It could be nighttime right now. I don't know. It's not absolute truth that it's daytime. So he applies this method of doubt. I don't know if this exists, if this exists, if this exists. And he comes to the conclusion that I don't know if anything exists. But there's one thing that I can't doubt. I'm here. I can't doubt that. I am here. I'm the one asking all these questions. I can't doubt that much. So he comes up with a statement that says, I think, therefore I am. As long as I'm thinking, I'm not sure if everything else is true, but the fact that I'm thinking means I'm here. And this is our thinking now. Because I'm thinking, I must exist. Because I'm thinking, I must exist. Otherwise, who's this guy thinking? What's this voice in my head? Who's the one that's listening to this talk right now? It must be, there must be a me that's listening to this. And if I am here, then you must also be there. Because you're just another I. So if I'm here, then you must be there as well. And then the mind starts creating distinctions. Well, if there's so many I am's here, some of them I agree with and some of them I don't agree with. So the mind then starts creating things that it likes. So I like that guy. I don't really like that guy over there. Because that guy agrees with me and that guy doesn't agree with me. That guy supports the same football team as me. That guy supports a different team, the rivals. So the mind starts creating associations. That's a guy that I like. That's a guy I don't like. And if there is an I am, then this I am should have a name. Because otherwise, how am I going to find who all the other I am's are? So you give yourself a name. I am this guy. I'm that guy. And the mind starts creating a whole persona. And because you've got this persona, you've come under this delusion that I exist. And because there is an I am, your meditation can't work either. Because you sit there and you're calling something else. And there's an expectation that says, that there is a God somewhere and He needs to come find me or I need to find Him. Me and God. This distinction is created. And what happens when you sit in your Simran or you're trying to meditate or you're trying to do Mool Mantar and it doesn't work? Then frustration comes. Why is it not working? Everybody tells me there's a God. Everyone tells me if I just sit down and do Waiguru for a few minutes, I'm supposed to connect but I'm not connecting. Because the very thing that you're using to connect hasn't been addressed. The very person looking for God is the one that you need to address. And this frustration, this separation, is born out of this dualistic thinking. I am trying to connect with God. What do we do when we do our Naam Simran? When you sit down and you do your Naam Simran, let's say you're doing a Waheguru job and you're saying Waheguru, Waheguru, Waheguru. In reality, what you're saying is, come on God, come on God, come on God, come on God, come on God. 
And after a while, it's like, come on, mate. Come on. Come on, God. Come on, God. And that's what you're saying. Why haven't you arrived yet? It's been six minutes. <laughs> that should be enough. If I, if I wanted to speak to somebody else, I call their name after two or three times they turn up. But you don't show up. There must be something wrong. And if you do this for long enough, eventually you'll come to the conclusion that God doesn't come. He doesn't come. How many times should I ask? And of the 10, 15 years I've been doing Simran, are you telling me that even once I didn't ask properly that he couldn't come once? If I've been doing it for so many years, am I so far, far back down the queue that he had to meet everybody else but he couldn't meet me? You start questioning these things. But the culprit isn't God, the culprit is the I am. I am trying to connect with God. No matter how many times you ask for the sun to shine into your room, if you don't open the curtain, the sun, bichara, kikare, what can the sun do? The sun is doing as much as it can. It's shining, it's there. Apart from burning your curtains down, it can't really do anything. And what is God to do? If you haven't opened the curtains, if you haven't gotten rid of the one who's I am, then what's Bichara God going to do? He's like, I'm already here, mate. I'm already here. I'm already here. That's God Simran to you, he's saying. Because if you are looking for money, if you're looking for wealth, and you've lived in a room, you were born into a room that all that there was was diamonds and jewels and gold coins everywhere. And then somebody tells you there's this thing called money. You say, where, where? I can't see it. Where is it? Has he created the duality or have you created the duality? Where is the duality? Does the duality even exist? You see, when you work for your money, when you get your paycheck at the end of the month, you know you've done something. There's a sense of, actually, there's a value in this. If you're born in a room where all that exists is money, where's the value? If you work for an hour, you might earn 10 pounds, right? Whatever you're at hourly rate is, you might earn, you do an hour's worth of work, you might earn 10 pounds, 20 pounds. And you can understand that if I do an hour's worth of work, I'll get an hour's worth of pay. But here, you're not asking for 10 pounds. You're not asking for a million pounds or a billion pounds. You're asking for God. You're asking for the entire universe and you think in five, ten minutes of Simran that you should be able to obtain the whole universe. How is that possible? If for one hour's worth of work, all you're worth is 10, 15, 20 pounds, then why in one hour's worth of Simran should you get the entire universe? What you're asking for is too big. But the reality is, that God doesn't even need one second. If the way that you look for God is the right way. If you walk in the right direction, you'll find that it's already there. The question is, how do we walk in the right direction? And this is the path of Sikhi. This is what Mool Mantra is trying to teach you. How do I walk in the right direction that I may have the darshan of God? And when you sit in your meditation, when you do your Naam Simran, your very expectation that God should come any minute now is the reason why God will never show up.
because you have an expectation. Come on, God. I'm sure you should be able to come and visit me at some point. The very meditation itself, the very Simran itself that you're trying to do, is I am calling your name. I am calling for you. Why haven't you turned up yet? I am trying to connect with God. So what you're expecting, you know what we expect when God finally turns up? You're sitting in your meditation and it's all sort of dark clouds and then something opens and a big light and there's a God with a big deep voice that says, I've been waiting for you. Come, my child. That's what we're expecting in reality. And you say, oh, thank you, God. Finally, meri wari agi. My turn is here. Finally, you came. You gave me your darshan. But you don't change. God has to come visit me, but the me that he has to come visit is just me. Me, Mr. Nice Guy. I'm okay. I'm not a bad guy. But you're not expecting to change yourself. You're expecting Mr. God to show up. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying, actually the one that's looking for God, let's address that guy. Let's forget Mr. God. Let's talk about you. Who do you think you are? Who is the one looking for God? So you can say, all right, I get it now. God, this God thing, oneness. I'm God, God is me, I get it. So where is he? Come on then, show me this God. If everything that you're saying is true, show me this God. Where is he? My answer to you is, using the ocean analogy, is there any part of the ocean where water doesn't exist? My answer to you is, where isn't God? And the scary thing is that the answer is God's here right now. You know, we're all sitting here talking about God. Whatever this God thing is, it's here right now. It's here. And you're saying, but I'm here. And I can see all these lovely people sitting around me. But where's God? The thinking has to change. The understanding has to change. Show me where in the universe the universe doesn't exist. Where in the ocean does the water not exist? It's here, right now. There's a very simple story that I love to retell because I think it very clearly indicates how we need to look at this. There's a holy man, a sadhu, who's sitting on the side of a road <coughs> and he hasn't eaten for days. And somebody comes along, a rich man comes along and throws him a bread, piece of bread. The holy man picks up the bread and gives it to a dog. The rich man turns back and he starts laughing at him saying, you haven't eaten for days, I've thrown you some bread and you're feeding the dog. And he starts laughing at him, what a foolish man you are. And the holy man says, God is feeding God and God is laughing at God. If God eats or if God eats or if God laughs at God, or God says something good to God, or God insults God, all that there is, is God. This is what Guru Nanak Dev Ji is saying here. All that exists is God. All that there is in this room right now, is God. Not Mr. God, not that guy, but everything here that is in this room present right now, is God. 
all the fingers of the same hand right here in this room right now. So look around you. If you want to know where God is, look around. What have you been looking at? A fish looking around saying, where's the ocean, where's the water, where's the water, where's the water? What are you looking for? All that you're looking for is here. You can say, well, God might have been here at some point, but God isn't here right now. When was God here? We could have sat here this whole day and walked away and said, yeah, we were all here. I can count the number of people here, but when was God here? The answer is ik. What in terms of time has the answer one? What sort of time <coughs> is one? All time. God is always here. And if God is always here, God's here right now. But it's this use of this word God that's distracting us. Mr. God. Let's put that word away. Let's change the word God to something else. What if we change the word God to universe? Is the universe in this room right now? Yeah? You say, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, we're all part of the universe. So the part of the universe is here right now. Some universe is outside as well, but some universe is very clearly here. What about if we use the word life? Is life in this room right now? You'll all agree, say yeah. Even if none of us are in this room, there is life in this room. So if life can exist in this room, right here, right now, in this moment, if the universe can exist in this room, what have you been looking for? You've been looking for Mr. God. Like he's something else. Like it's a he. Guru Nanak Dev Ji saying that all that you can see around you is what you're looking for. It's ik. It's oneness. Stop looking for God. Because by saying the word God, you're putting him away somewhere. You're separating him. The very use of certain words creates the separation. Guru Nanak is very careful. He says all that there is is ik right now. Can anyone say that ik doesn't mean God? Ik means something else. Ik does mean God. The ik that Guru Nanak Dev Ji is talking about is the God. And God is continuously here. The oneness that we're looking for is always here right now. And from one moment to the next, the now continues. The one continues. It's ever evolving. It's always here. Life is here in this room right now. There's a presence of life in this room right now. And the same life that's in you is in you. And the same life that's in you is in all of you. So terminology is very important. You can understand terminology like this. The same life energy that's in you is in an ant, is in a fly, is in a tree is in every single one of us. Some people call it Jyot. We all have the same Jyot. But certain words become confusing. Oh yeah, we have God's light in us somewhere, but I've never seen it. Change your terminology. Do you have life in you right now? Are you alive? Is there life? There's even life in a dead person. It's just life in everything. So what you're looking for has been the thing that's confused you. It's very simple. And you might actually get a little bit deflated. Oh, is that it? Oh, I thought it was something bigger than that. I thought there was something more to it than that. Why does everyone make it sound so complicated? Do you think Guru Nanak has ever tried to confuse you? Do you think Guru Nanak came here to confuse you? Or does Guru Nanak try and make it sick, make Sikhi simple? It's a very simple path. It's a very simple path. Because it's here right now, the answer is here right now, it's already there. The only thing that needs to change is your eyes. 
your way of looking at it needs to change. So you're going to ask, all right, let's say I accept that God's here. What do I do with it then? So what shall I do now? And again, I'm going to push the question back at you. Who's asking? You're going to say, I am asking. Well, maybe there's a bit more work that we have to do then. If I am still here to ask the question, then maybe there's a bit more work to do.